uh, and all of us, we are a technology generation. Even some old people like me and Pastor Fred are into technology. And uh, technology can fill all of our time if we allow it. And uh, it pulls on our mind continually. The Bible says, let your mind be transformed by God. And if your mind is plugged into technology all the time, when is God going to have a chance to transform your mind? So part of it happens here, but part of it has to happen between you and God. God talks best to you when you are alone. So when, when you are alone, sometimes instead of picking up a computer or picking up an iPad or a Kindle or a phone and starting to text or starting to scroll, uh, just be quiet and listen to what God has to say to you so you don't miss anything. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, about some of the ways God talks to us in uh, if you are watching the AD series, you saw on Sunday night um, the salvation of the Ethiopian eunuch who was traveling in the desert reading the scroll, and Philip came and uh, brought him the good news. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. Now, we remember from before one of our previous studies, we remember that Philip had gone to Samaria, and there was a great revival there. The people there were accepting Jesus. You know, uh, when you have been outcast for a long, long time, you feel needy. You feel like you need to be accepted. You need to be loved. You need someone to love you. And that's how the nation of Samaria was. They had been outcast by the Jews for a long time. Now, finally, a Jewish man named Philip came to Samaria to invite them to join with the believers in Jesus Christ. It's not surprising that God used that opportunity to draw many to himself through the ministry of Philip. Now, let's think back or let's think of some time when you've been involved in a great revival. When you are involved in a great revival, it fills your life, right? Everything in your life changes when you're involved in a great revival. We had a great revival here that went on for about three years. It filled our lives, right? Our schedule changed. We wanted to come to church, come to church, come to church, come to church. Why? Because we knew when we arrived here, the presence of God was going to come down an awesome way. And it was drawing us, it was drawing us, it was drawing us. During that time, we were all very busy, 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 busy. We were busy praying, we were busy witnessing, we were busy preaching, we were busy telling, we were busy doing, we were busy, 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 busy. During that time, that's how revival is. You remember that? Everyone remember? Okay, now, this is the same way it was with Philip in Samaria. They were busy. It was exciting. People were coming to be healed. People were coming to accept Christ. People were coming to listen to Philip preach. And then suddenly, it says... As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go down south 
to the desert road that runs to Jeru from Jerusalem to Gaza. He's all busy. He's all doing, doing, doing the work of God. He's having great success. And an angel shows up and tells him, go to the desert alone. See, during the time of revival when everyone is receiving wonderful things from God, you want to be together. You want to be together, sharing testimony. This is what God did for me. This is what happened at our house. This is what happened to us. This is how God poured out his spirit on us. You want to share and testify and witness and talk to each other. It's just, it just overwhelms your brain and your spirit and your soul and your emotions. And you just want to be together with that group of people that are feeling the power of God what was happening to Philip and, and God suddenly sent an angel and said go down there walk out in the desert well, suppose God told you tonight an, an angel appeared to you and said Blake I want you to walk out into the desert you know walk out there to Arizona you know, well, Blake would say, well, wait a minute. I have school tomorrow. Maybe even Blake's mother would say, hey, wait a minute. Blake has school tomorrow. See, we all have our plans. We all have our responsibilities. We all have our duties. And we all have our schedule. And we know, you know, some of us know better than others what's going to happen tomorrow. I prefer surprises. I don't plan, plan, plan tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. My husband lays in bed at night and I ask, what are you thinking? He says, oh, I'm thinking how to fill that storage room box by box. This has to go in first. This has to go. I'm just like, wait until tomorrow. Go and just go, oh, okay, this box, I can put this here and why just lay awake at night planning? I don't understand that, but I know this. Some people are planners, and some people are uh, spontaneous. Wake up in the morning and, hmm, what do I feel like today? See, he plans the night before what clothes I'm going to wear. He plans the night before what I'm going to eat for breakfast. Me, I just like go to bed. Tomorrow morning when I get up, I go, hmm, what do I feel like today? But we all, all of us, no matter if we're planners or spontaneous people, it doesn't matter. We all have responsibilities, things we know we have to get accomplished. You know, I know every Monday I have to complete the music for Tuesday night worship practice. I know every Monday I have to work on that. I know every Monday I need to start thinking about Tuesday night And I know that all day on Tuesday, I'm going to be in the Word, studying the Word and thinking about tonight. See, So we all have plans. We have things we have to do. Suddenly, an angel appears and says, God said, do something else. And it's a shock. Because many times when God has plans for you, you're clueless. You don't know anything about it. And then suddenly God reveals his plan and says, okay, I have something for you. Sometimes it happens because your boss fires you. And you think a really bad thing happened to you a really awful thing happened to you and the boss was really mean to you and all the while that was God 
setting you up for the next thing he wants you to do. And we're clueless. And we're in a paranoid state. What's going to happen? How are we going to survive? It's like, what are we going to do now? Especially if you've been in the same place for a long time. If you've been working on the same job for a long time, it's a big surprise when God says, go out in the desert. <clears throat> it says, so Philip started out. Now, God did not tell him exactly where he was going. The same thing when God called Abraham. God didn't tell him exactly where he was going. He said, get out of your country. Go, I will tell you later where. Just start. Well, back then, it was easy to just start because mostly there was one road in, one road out. Now, in California, we have many freeways. And if God says go, we're just like, which way? I don't know. But if God tells you, get up, go, you get your keys, you get in your car, you start the motor. And you start driving somewhere until God reveals the next thing. The next thing. God has a next thing for you. In this situation, God had revival for Philip, success in ministry for Philip, and now suddenly it's time for Philip to go to the desert. A new thing. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Kandake, the queen of Ethiopia. Now, this man was a slave, but he was a slave in high position working for the queen. Perhaps Philip had never really met anyone in that high position before. Philip was walking. That man had a chariot. He was riding. You know, the people who have cars going by out there on the street, they uh, have more money than the people who are walking on the street. unless they're spending all their money for the car and they're broke, but... But you understand what I mean. This man had a chariot and a horse. Philip was walking. This tells me that sometimes when God has a plan for you, he doesn't... Um, you don't have everything you need to complete the plan. In the beginning. You don't have, Philip only had two feet. That's all he had, and he said, walk out there in the desert. No, he didn't know where he was going. The desert is big. See, the vision that God gives sometimes is big, and you're just like, how can I do this? This seems impossible. How in the world will I ever be able to do this? <clears throat> the big revival is happening. Philip is the leader of the revival. Everything is going better than Philip had expected. Life couldn't be better. 
Sometimes God breaks in when your life is fine. Everything is going smooth. You have everything in order. You have a job. God's providing. You're paying all your bills. Everything is good. You know who I am, what I'm here for, what I'm doing. Now, an angel only comes at the command of God. If an angel shows up and tells you something, it's because God ordered it. Angels don't think for themselves. See, humans, we think for ourselves way too much. (laughs) But angels don't think for themselves. When an angel shows up and talks to you and tells you God said this, You can believe it. You can believe it. Angels are of two kinds, proclaimers or messengers and warriors. Those are the two kinds we see in the Word of God over and over and over. People who come with information and uh, and angels who come for war to fight Satan. Okay, so when an angel shows up, you know one of two things. God has a word for you, a message. The angel has a message for you from God, or you're ready to fight the devil and that angel is there to help you. Those are the two reasons angels show up in the Bible over and over and over and over again. When an angel shows up, pay attention. You you think, oh, well, an angel will never show up and talk to me. What we expect from God is normally what happens to us. So if you sit there and think, an angel will never show up and talk to me, he probably won't. But if you're sitting there thinking, why not? An angel talked to Mary. An angel talked to Peter. An angel talked to Daniel. An angel talked to Abraham. An angel talked to Moses. An angel talked to all of these people. Why not me? Why not you? Maybe the reason an angel has never talked to you is because you have never given God permission to send one. You've never let God know, God, if you want to send an angel to me, go for it. I will listen. I will listen. We don't worship angels because God is the one who sends them. We we see an angel, it comes from God. Sometimes we do not see them because we do not expect them. Being led by an angel and being led by the Spirit of God is very much alike. In one situation, uh, the angel comes and tells you what God has said. In the other situation, God himself, God the Holy Spirit, comes and tells you what he wants. It's very much the same. And your response and my response should be the same. The first thing is we should be led by the Spirit. 
the angel told Philip what God wanted, but Philip was led by the Spirit out into that desert. He's following God's orders. He's following the orders of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Now, I'm going to read this passage in two different uh, translations because I want you to have the two different points of view that it gives. One is says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now, when uh, you have studied the Bible, oftentimes people have told you when you see the word flesh, it's talking about sin. But the truth is when you see the word flesh, it's talking about your own human desires. Not all of our own human desires are sin. Some of our own human desires are good things that we want to do to help other people. You know, I wanted to teach school for many years. I wanted to teach deaf students in school. That was my human desire. It was what I wanted to do. There wasn't any sin in it, but it was my human desire. One day, God showed up to me, and he said, it's time to quit. And I was like, surprised. Surprised. Like, quit. God said, yes, you've worked long enough. It's time for you to work for me now. And I was thrilled about the work for me part. I liked the idea of that. Um, but the lose $60,000 a year income part, I wasn't so excited about that. It meant change of life. It meant before I always had my own money, I could do whatever I wanted with that. Every two weeks, I got a paycheck, and I could buy new clothes, or I could buy a new car, or I could do whatever I wanted with it. After I quit that job, I had to get rid of my Lincoln. I couldn't afford it anymore. It was a life change. I had to drive a brown church van. Instead of a Lincoln town car. Being led by the Spirit means obeying what God says, no matter what. Now, see, we have a choice. My human flesh could have held on to what I had. Or my human flesh could... Let go of that and obey what God said. Philip could have held on to the revival in Samaria. He could have continued preaching, preaching, preaching. And you know, I think if he continued preaching there, people would continue to be saved. People would continue to be healed. But Philip would not be in the plan of God. Because the plan of God for Philip at that moment was go out to the desert. It says, when you do what God wants, it's not always what you want. It's, it's not always what you plan. You know, I hear people talk about being called to ministry, but they're like, but understand, I don't want to move far from my family. What if God calls you far from your family? All my life of ministry, we have been far from our family. 
the closest we've ever been to our family in ministry was about an hour and a half. And then God moved us, and it was more far. You know, it was like some family lived close, and we stayed there, and then God moved us again, and no one lived there. And then God moved us to California, and for sure no one was in California. See? It's like you can't have limits if you're going to follow God. You can't have this list that says, God, I will follow you, but this, 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 I, you know, I have to have this, 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 this. And, you know, I think God sits on his throne and goes, oh, really? (laughs) I thought you were following me. Instead, you have your list. You're following your list. Let's look at this same verse in the the Message Bible. It says, I better get my glasses. My counsel is this, live freely, animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Let's talk about the word, animated. What does it mean? Yeah, okay, see, you have, you have pictures of Mickey Mouse. You have a picture, it's dead. It's just a picture. Hmm. Or you have an animated. It moves. It moves. It moves. Animated by the Spirit of God means... God is going to move you, not um, maybe location, we don't know, but for sure, God is going to get you up on your feet doing things that you were not doing before. You know, God's looking down at, at people and he's just saying, they're just a picture. Oh, I want to move that person. I want them to move. I want, you know, which is more interesting? A picture or an animation? The movie. It moves. It's more in, even, you know, I prefer to go to a kid's movie than read a kid's book. You know, parents sometimes, they're like, oh, I have to go to another kid's movie. I can remember when my boys were small and we brought them to the first Muppet, Muppet movie. Oh, I thought I would die before I got out of that theater. The most boring, stupid thing I had ever seen in my life. This lady is not crazy about comedy. To me, it's just like people trying to be funny is not funny. (laughs) And I watched that movie and it's just like, man, how can the kids be laughing at this? It's just like... Really? A frog and a pig. (laughs) You know. I mean, you know. But God wants Christians who are moving, who are doing something. And he has the design. He has invented the movie for your life. But if you are not careful, you will sit and be a picture just sitting on the church pew all of your life. He says, you know, he says, my counsel is this, live freely, moving and motivated by God's spirit that you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. Now, see, the other translation says sin. The the King James Bible says sin. But it's our selfish desires, what we want for ourselves. I want something different for myself. 
And God says, if you are not motivated and moved by the Spirit of God, you will do what yourself wants. And sometimes what yourself and myself wants will get us in trouble. It says, for there is a root of sin-filled self-interest in us that is at odds with the spirit self interest is my ambition self interest wow the world is so full of self right now everyone is taking pictures of themselves Oh, picture of myself, picture of myself, picture of myself, picture of myself. Oh, get one of these one sticks so you can take a better picture of yourself. It says, you know, don't, God says, my counsel is this. Don't be self-absorbed. Because self has a sin nature. Every one of our selves have a sin nature. When we're saved, it is not eliminated. It is still there. What did Paul the Apostle say? He said, I fight against myself every day. I fight against myself. What was he doing? You know, he was fighting his own sin nature, his nature that wanted to do things that were not God-motivated, God-directed. We all have that. We all have that. Especially when I don't understand what God's doing. If I knew, you know, God did not tell Philip when you go out into the desert, you're going to meet a rich man and you're going to get up in his chariot and you're going to tell him about me. And he's going to be saved and you're going to get to baptize him. God didn't tell Philip anything. God was quiet. When God is quiet about what he's doing, it's harder for us to obey. Because we want to know. My friend, we are close, Mabel, she wants to know. She doesn't want to just jump out there and do something. She's got question, 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 question about it, right? You want to know. I do want to know, too. If someone brings up a word, I don't know what it means. I go like, let me see. What does this mean? I have to know what this word means. I have to know. I can't just be satisfied to let that word just kind of slip past my ears. I have to understand what does it mean. But God that isn't always ready to tell us everything. He wants obedience before we know. Before we know, he wants us to obey. Why? Why? Right, those two reasons. He wants us to be faithful, and he wants us to trust him. It's like when God tells us to do something, and we don't understand why, and we don't understand why God is pushing us, pushing us, pushing us to do this, and we don't understand it, and it's like we go ahead and do it anyway. That shows God, I trust you. I have faith in you. If you say do it, it's the best thing for me. It's the best thing for me. See, it says, 
self-interest is at odds with the spirit. The spirit can't flow with selfishness. When you and I are selfish, it blocks the flow of the Holy Spirit. That's why giving tithes and offerings is so important. It's not because God needs your money. It's because selfishness blocks the flow of the Holy Spirit. And when you give, God flows. And when you hold, God stops. And God holds. If you want God to bless you financially, you give, 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 give. And you will notice in a short time, something starts happening in your finances. Something starts flowing in. Something starts flowing in. I can't explain that, but it's happened in my life so many, many, many times. I can't tell you how many times. God just says, give this. Oh, hey. You know, uh, while I was gone on vacation, Before, actually, before I went on vacation, I made a commitment that if God gave to me, I would give. And I just made the commitment to God. I said, God, as often as you give to me, I will give. And while I was on vacation, someone handed me $400. And immediately, that day, that day, less than 30 minutes later, I gave out of that $400. When I arrived home Sunday night, you know, when you arrive back from vacation, you're always broke, right? <laughs> I arrived home Sunday night when I came here to church at 4.30. At the end of the service, someone came up to me and they said, Pastor Linda, some, some man is looking for you. His name is Kurt. And I was like, I don't know anyone named Kurt except one man in uh, New Hope's church, and it wasn't him because he was talking to my husband. So, you know, I knew it wasn't him. Someone was looking for you. Maybe he went out. So I went out to the back and went around here, and there was a man over here, and he walks up, and he has, he has black leather jacket, black leather pants, and he has a, a motorcycle helmet in his hand like this. And he walks up. And I said, I don't know him. But he... He recognized me right away. He walked right to me out of all the people in the parking lot. And uh, so I greeted him. Hello, he shook my hand. And he told me, he said, I came to this church on a Tuesday night in 2013. And he said, when I came that night, I was just like, my life was just messed up. It was just messed up. I was just depressed. I needed God to help me. And he said, everything you preached that night just answered my heart. And then we talked, and I prayed with him, and, and he said, I work for Microsoft. Microsoft. And he said, I work in Seattle, Washington, but I'm here meeting with a producer and working. And he said, the Lord just pulled me here. And he said, I have something for you. And he gave me an envelope. And he left. $500. What did I do? I didn't wait. Five minutes later, I'm giving. Too bad you were not here. <laughs> oh, Mabel, she said she was here. <laughs> she, she, ran, she ran home fast because she needed a nap. <laughs> but see, it's like the flow, the flow, the flow. If God can trust you to flow, he will provide for you. Something to flow with. <laughs> you know, you know. 
It's like, that's how the church succeeds. That's how the church continues because we give, we help. We, we, we don't just keep all the money that comes in for ourselves. We share with the community. We give to missions. We help the poor. We do what we can do because of the flow. But when God calls you to do something, he motivates you by his spirit. He moves you. You don't always know where the provision is going to come from. The only thing you know about where the provision will come from is you know the provider. He's like, he told me to go. It's his responsibility to finance my going. <laughs> yeah, he says it's a lot of fun to live that way. It is. It is. You know what? It's fun when, when someone gives to you. It's fun. It's also fun when you give it out. It's just like, oh, double, double blessing. You know, you're just like, whoo. It says, selfishness and spirit-led life oppose each other. You will never walk in a spirit-led life if you are selfish. Mine, 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 mine. You'll never experience the spirit-led life like that. It says, so that you cannot live sometimes one way, the spirit way, and sometimes another way, the selfish way. It says, you are not permitted to bounce back and forth. God's spirit-led way and the selfish way. Jump, 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 jump. It says, you can't live that way according to how you feel. Don't let your feelings rule your life. You know, when I've gone through dark, hard times, I did not let my feelings rule me. When I've gone through dark, hard times, the last place I wanted to come was this church. Because it didn't make me feel good to walk in. But I kept coming, I kept coming, I kept coming, I kept coming, until it felt good again. Don't let your feelings block you from staying where God has led you. Also, don't let your feelings keep you where it's comfortable when God is telling you, go. Right? It can work both ways. Sometimes God tells us, go, and we're just like, but I don't know if I can do that. I don't know. It's like when we got called to go to India. You know, the other mission trips I had gone on, I was just someone going. Someone else was responsible for leading and making sure every, all the money was there and making sure the money got changed to the new uh, currency and making sure everyone had what they needed and, you know, followed all the rules and had the passports and had the medical papers and had the shots they needed and all of that stuff. I'm not good at organizing things. That's not really my best skill. But God called me and said, go to India. Lead a group, seven people. 
you know, that trip cost us $28,000. I certainly didn't have $28,000. But God said, go. I really didn't know everything I was supposed to do. How you do this, this. It had never been my experience before. But I went. I went in obedience. It says, so why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit? So and so escape the erratic compulsions of the law-dominated experience. See, if we just stay and we don't listen to the Spirit, we'll be afraid to do anything. And the law will rule us. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. You know, when you get ready to do something for God, the devil is just going to come and talk, 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 talk. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. You're not smart enough. You're not wise enough. You're not experienced enough. You don't know enough. You're too old. You're too young. Whatever. The Spirit doesn't care about any of those things. He doesn't care how old you are. He doesn't care how experienced you are not or are. He doesn't care your qualifications in the natural life. All he's looking at is a heart that is willing to trust and obey and be faithful. He says, walk in the Spirit. Philip went out walking in the desert in the Spirit. Spirit. Now, walking is a lot like dancing. And when you walk in the Spirit, it's a lot like dancing. I'm not a good dancer, so I'm not going to demonstrate dancing. Um, but I know this about dancing. If one person is dancing in one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, that's a waltz. If another person is dancing in one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and those two people get together and they're trying to dance together, someone is going to fall down because they're not in sync. It has to be both of them, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and their dance goes and goes and goes. But if it's conflicting, then it's going to be a disaster. When we go walking with God, if we are not walking, following his time, we will fail. We will fail. Watch this. God talks to Philip about time. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning back home to Africa, seated in his carriage, and he was reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk alongside the chariot. Now, which moves faster, a man walking or a chariot being pulled by a horse? Yeah, the chariot is faster. So what happens? The man has to keep up with God's command. Look what Philip does. He says, Philip ran. Philip ran. and overheard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. 
Sometimes we fall behind where God wants us to be or the goal where God wants us to be is out there ahead of us. And God says, oh, you need to be walking right there. That's where I want you, right there, by this chariot. And I'm back here. And it requires that I run to catch up. Sometimes our spirit becomes cold and just... You know, I know. Sometimes we have fire and sometimes we have cold. And sometimes the cold, those are almost out. And then God says, run, catch up to what I want for you. And we have to make that fire burn. Stir up. You know, David talked about stirring up himself, stirring himself up in the Lord getting himself on fire so he could do what God wanted him to do. So Philip ran. Philip could not hear what the man was talking about from way back there. He had to be close to hear him reading. God knew that even though Philip didn't know why God wanted him to run. He was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked him, do you understand what you are reading? Now, I just want to say about this, this African man had been given a scroll from somewhere. During that time in history, scrolls of the Bible, the Old Testament, were very old already. A thousand years old, and they'd been copied and copied and copied and copied and copied. So maybe the one he had was a new copy, but there were not many copies. You couldn't buy a copy of the book of Isaiah in Jerusalem a long time ago. Someone, it, mostly all of the copies were in the temple. We have no evidence that uh, Jesus had a copy of the Old Testament that he uh, like carried around, a scroll. We have no evidence that the disciples had those. But this African slave had one. What does that tell you? God had a vision for Africa. And he was going to make sure that the gospel made it there. God had a vision for Africa. And he had one man, and he had, there's one chance. There's one chance for this to happen, and God has to get Philip out there. What if Philip was stubborn and didn't obey or didn't listen to God? Yeah. The gospel would have been lost to that part of the world. Think of the millions of people who since then have heard the gospel message because that one man got saved that day. Because that one evangelist was willing to go out there at the command of God. Breathe by the Spirit. Acts 8.31, the man replied, How can I understand except someone teaches me? And he urged Philip, Come up and sit in the carriage with me. 
any time you see someone in the Bible moving up, it means God is promoting them. At this moment, when Philip went from the ground into that chariot, God promoted Philip for his obedience. That's what the symbol is there. He moved up in power and in authority with God and man. The passage of Scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? What does that mean? Who can speak of his descendants? What does that mean? It means Jesus didn't have any kids. He didn't have any children. It means Jesus came to earth as a man, but God did not allow Jesus to be married and to have children in the natural. And Jesus obeyed God and did exactly what God wanted. And then he was crucified. He was killed, the Lamb of God. It says, for his life was taken from the earth. He didn't have children because he didn't live long enough. It wasn't in God's plan. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet Isaiah talking about himself or talking about someone else? So, beginning with this scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus as they rode along. They came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop. They went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. The breath of the Spirit happens when you speak the good news about Jesus. The breath of the Spirit happens when you talk about Jesus. You have the Spirit of God in you, and when you speak the name of Jesus to someone else, the breath of the Spirit flows out to them. That breath of the Spirit that is in you is life-changing for them. And that's why um, it's so horrible when we are afraid to speak up, when we're afraid to witness, when we're afraid to tell people about Jesus. It's like if we saw someone there and they were, you know, they had been drowning or whatever, and they stopped breathing, and we know CPR, and we just stand there and watch them die. We have the breath of life in our lungs. We can give it to them, but we just, oh, that person is dirty. I don't want to touch them and we let them die. The same thing is true. You have the spiritual breath of life inside of you. Your uh, experience with Jesus Christ, your knowledge of God, the indwelling spirit of God in you, you have it, and you breathe it out. That's how you give it to other people. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? And uh, 
Jesus rose again, and he went to where the disciples were there, and the Bible says he breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the same Spirit that they received on the day of Pentecost when they spoke in tongues. Later, they received the Spirit of fire, but... When Jesus breathed on them, that was their salvation experience after the cross. They believed in Jesus before the cross, but after Jesus died, they weren't sure. They were doubting. They were fearful. They were confused. And then Jesus shows up, and Jesus breathed on them, and suddenly they're sure. Sure enough to die for it. There are people out there wait, waiting for you to give them CPR. And you can stand and be afraid and do nothing, or you can breathe the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ on them. How do I start? What do I do? Tell your story. How did you find Jesus? What was your life before you found Jesus? What is your life now? How is your life now different than before you found Jesus? What hard times has Jesus brought you through? What kind of success has Jesus given you? Tell the good news. It's breath. It's life to people who will hear it. He says, why can't I be baptized? And they ordered the carriage to stop. They went down into the water, and he was baptized. And then Philip was moved by the Spirit again. Look at this last verse. <clears throat> Verse 39, it says, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. One minute, Philip was there baptizing this man in water. He goes, Doom, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Did you see it on TV? It was awesome. And then all of a sudden, he brings him up and... The man looks around. He's like, where'd he go? If you missed that, I feel sorry for you. Go on the Internet and watch it. It was exciting. It made me happy. But it says, look, it says, but the man went away, went back to Africa rejoicing. 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 Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north at a town of Azotus. He preached the good news there in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. Wouldn't you just love for God just to yank you up and set you down in New York City to preach the gospel? <laughs> now, here's the thing. I believe that God transported Philip. I believe that. I don't doubt that. I don't try to explain something happened and the man fell asleep and Philip walked and left. And I, you know, I don't try to explain away the truth of the Word of God. God transported by the Spirit, Philip, to another town so far that he had to walk back to his home. Why did God do that to Philip? Because God knew Philip would breathe out the Word of God everywhere. 
Maybe the reason God doesn't transport us here or there is because we're silent. Maybe. Maybe. See, that might have been the result of the promotion. Obedience brings the promotion. <laughs> she said she says if if I wasn't expecting uh, I wasn't expecting God to transport me somewhere and all of a sudden I'm transported somewhere and I look around and I'm in a different place and it's like how am I gonna know where I am? <laughs> See, but if God puts us somewhere and we're just like sitting there wondering, it's like, what, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Then look around for someone to share the gospel with because that's why you're there. <laughs> See, we met, you know, sometimes we're just like, we find ourselves in a place and we're just like, why did I come here? And we're just like, why did I come here? I don't know why I came here. And you're just sitting there and it's just like, look around, find that person that God has put you there to tell them the story of you and Jesus. If you start by telling the story of you and Jesus from that point, you can move to the story of Jesus on the cross. It gives you a chance, to, an open door. You tell me your experience. I'll tell you my experience. Share. What's your life been? What's my life has been? And then my life was changed because I believe Jesus came to die on that was life changing. That was the moment my life changed and became better. So let us be challenged tonight to be like Philip. Hear the voice of God. Hear the voice of the Spirit. Obey. Obey. Be led. Walk with God's time. Breathe with God the words of truth and life. Breathe with God. Save the dying. Let God promote you and move you to do more for his kingdom as you walk in obedience to him. God, I thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for how you put this word together for me today and last night. <laughs> I'm amazed. <laughs> I'm amazed, God, at how you talk to us and how you work with us. It's just overwhelming, God, what you do, how you design our lives. Help us all to recognize your hand when we experience things that make us question. Let us immediately think, oh, this is God. What is God doing? How can I walk with him? How can I follow him? How can I breathe with him? How can we dance together, God and me? So that the gospel of Jesus Christ can spread before you come again. We ask it, Lord Jesus, in your name.